Um, I'm Marverine Oliver. Uh, three of the people in the room are from my department, so you are? Stephanie Medina. I'm in the curriculum and instruction department. C9, okay. And is your dissertation actually a qualitative design? It is. Design uh, and I'm studying study abroad uh, in science education, and I'm collecting concept maps, interviews, and journal entries as my data sources. Okay, good, okay. And I've done, I'm done with chapters one, two, and three, and right now I'm processing and managing data. Okay, all right. Um, I want to talk about how to present findings, but a piece of that is going to involve a little bit about data collection because sometimes data you're collecting and how you collect it has implications for how you present your findings, and there's just not a way to get around that as far as I can see. Um, one of the things that can make qual um, studies and dissertations difficult is because there's about nine bazillion, roughly, ways you can do them and still be correct. There are lots of ways to do it. I was looking through an old text when I was getting ready for this, and there was one chapter on presenting your quantitative findings, and it was 75 pages long, and it had all of these different statistical procedures along with a list under each one that said, did you remember to this? Did you remember to this? Did you remember to this? And with a long list of everything that should be included to, to adequately report findings from statistical procedures. It's, it's, this was specifically about dissertations and theses. The qual chapter had 23 pages plus about this much. I was generous if when I said 23 and a, I mean 24 and a quarter, uh, actually it was 23 and a quarter, on presenting qualitative results. There were no lists of procedures because there's so many and they vary so much amongst traditions but also within traditions. Um, there was no did you remember to include this or that for the same reason? Um, what the author did was pick three approaches, phenomenology, I don't know, maybe grounded theory and something else, and included a little excerpt of how one might present findings from that kind of study. Um, didn't find any more anywhere else uh, outside of textbooks we use for qual. But those tend to be method, uh, methodological. The reality about, uh, some of the realities about conducting qualitative studies is that because of the ontology and the, the notion that there are multiple meanings, there are lots of ways to conduct studies there are lots of ways to interpret materials, even within a broad approach, uh, or, yeah, a broad approach, like phenomenology. Um, and because of that, then there are multiple ways to present results. So this isn't gonna be an ABC thing. What I, it is gonna do, I hope, is give you some ways to think about your own research and how you're presenting it and as well as be aware of some common pitfalls because there are some common pitfalls that I see across studies and that others write about. Um, I want to go back to, this is actually your class, isn't it? Yeah. In my qual class, um, one of the things we do is we practice a little bit of data analysis from a phenomenological kind of approach because people need to handle data. And this is what it looked like one day as we were practicing in class. And each of the different piles are different students. Um, units of meaning and categories that they've come up with. And you can see just from looking at this that everybody had really different ideas. And of course when we put it together, um, the ideas were different from almost anybody's. The point is it can be messy and people need to recognize that. Uh, folks who don't 
aren't really familiar with qualitative research um, tend to think that's a limitation. Qualitative scholars would say, no, it's not. I mean, that's what this kind of research is about. And saying that that's a limitation makes about as much sense as saying it's a limitation when a quant study has 800 people in it. That's way too many. You know, so just be aware of that. So, anybody speak French? Me either. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this word. <laughs> One of the common themes I find about qualitative research is that it really helps if you can think of yourself as a researcher, as a bricoleur. There's something like that. I can't say it that way. That's somebody who makes do by adapting a bunch of little bits, odds and ends, if you will, leftovers. And the bricolage itself is the piece together representation of all of that stuff that's fitted to the specifics of a complex situation. In a nutshell, what that means is, as a researcher, if you're doing a qualitative study, you're making a quilt. One way or another, you're making a quilt. You're taking a bunch of pieces of things. Even if what you're doing is some kind of discourse analysis, you're still taking pieces of things and you're putting them together in a way that gives some sort of picture of a whole. I like pictures. It may be as simple as something like this, where there are all these disparate pieces but they're joined together in some kind of unifying way, thus the borders. Any of you sew or do embroidery? Or knew, had mothers or sisters or aunts that did embroidery? Yeah. One of the things that, I don't either, but my <laughs> mother loved embroidery. And so one of the things that you might find on a quilt like this is overlays of embroidered stuff that also trans, um, goes across all of these little borders and provides an overlay that unifies everything together. What I'm saying is that your data may have a lot of themes that are tied together in some kind of big picture and which may have other unifying data that sort of overlays the whole. That's going to depend on your design and your methods and what you get from your data. I mean, you're doing a lot of things with, you're getting different kinds of data. And so you may end up with things you never expected to get. For one thing, you never know exactly what you get, you're going to get when you get a, do a qualitative study. Or more, and you may have more levels of things than you anticipated. I thought about not including this at all because, in, I mean, people in my department know me, but people elsewhere obviously don't. And so, um, but I, I do need to take a time out for this because I think this has almost more impact on qualitative studies than it does in quant studies. You always want your writing to be good. I mean, you want it to be professional, you want it to be clean. In qualitative research, that can take on all kinds of new meanings because what you're doing is often emergent in design or methods or how you're going to analyze the data. And also because you are telling some story of whatever it is, your phenomenon, your subject matter, whatever it is, you're telling some kind of story about it. Feel free to come on in, pick up a handout if you'd like. And had I known earlier in my life, wherever you'd like, um, had you known maybe that you were going to end up in an academic um, environment at the doctoral level and maybe looking at an academic career and if you'd known you were going to have qualitative aspects to research you were involved in, maybe you would have taken a creative writing course somewhere, you know? Maybe you would have done that. Um, 
if you aren't already, if you'd only you'd known, maybe you would have read a lot of literature. I don't mean scholarly books, I, I, I mean literature, because part of how we learn how to tell narratives is that we read narratives. And uh, thank you. Oh, that's not as strong as, yeah, I want stuff in it. <laughs> Just a creamer would be fine, actually, thank you. It's not quite as strong as I was afraid it was gonna be. Um, we, we learn how to tell stories. We, we learn how to um, follow a plot. We learn something about how stories should sound. So if only you weren't in the middle of your dissertation, maybe you could read a lot of good novels if you hadn't done so already. Um, but you are in the middle of your dissertation, or soon to be. Are you doing your dissertation currently? Yeah. Okay. And, and what department are you in? Um, I'm a uh, Coastal Marine System Science program. Okay. Are you doing a qualitative piece to it? Quali qualitative research. You're, or you're doing a, never mind, don't oh, worry just, about it. Yeah, it's a qualitative, yeah. Okay. Uh, science, yes. um, but because you are where you are, um, and no matter what we might have wished we had done in preparation for what we are doing now, you figure out what you can do now. And what you can do now is, as you're writing, get consultation about what you're writing. And by that I mean, maybe you have a peer reviewer. Not a peer analyst necessarily, but a peer reviewer. Somebody who can read your stuff and see if it tells a story. See if it hangs together when they read it. Um, see if they have feedback about, um, I, I know people who are really good storytellers, really good storytellers, and they can give me feedback about whether I'm actually telling a story that is engaging, okay? Um, get people to read and critique who aren't familiar with your field. One of the kind of most fun um, dissertations I served on was one in teacher ed um, and the person who has since graduated was doing her dissertation on math language. Now, I don't know anything about math language. I'm a counselor um, and a counselor educator um, and I haven't been in even grad school since 1980. So I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Um, but the way she was ultimately able to put it together, it was really easy for me to read and understand what she was talking about, and to understand. I think even more importantly, um, why it mattered for for an outsider like me, not in that field. Um, She made it easy, okay? That's not a simple thing to do. And you want people to be, to be able to read your, the results of your research and understand what it says, why it matters, what the implications might be, all of that sort of thing. And that starts in your findings. <coughs> I have allergies, by the way. <laughs> your writing can make or break your results and your discussion. Now, <clears throat> your, your committee's going to help you with that. The writing center's going to help you with that. If you use an editor, they're going to help you with that. But what I want you to know is that when committees get a dissertation, if, if, if it's real badly written, it's hard for us to even track what you're trying to say. And if we can't understand what you're trying to say, it's gonna keep coming back to you and so it's gonna slow you down. <coughs> this is all of why that matters that you're writing. 
your results need to be clear. They need to be logical. They need to be um, to fit together with some kind of flow that makes sense for the reader. Um, what it can't be, and I've seen this happen a number of times, what it should not be is just a list of findings that seem kind of randomly listed there. That's not what a qualitative study should result in um, without any picture provided of how all that fits together and tells the story of your phenomenon or your participants or the situation that you're discussing the context that you're discussing. And you really have to make the connection for the readers. Sometimes it happens um, that we get dissertations that it's hard to tell what the point is, but the reason isn't that the person so much is a, a bad writer is that they know their topic so well that they assume everybody else gets it too. When you're writing your dissertation, you arguably are going to know more about your topic and your study than the other people on your committee, I mean, are, are, who are reading it. So something can seem plainly obvious to me, but if I don't talk about why it fits or how it fits or tell you enough then it can read like just a bunch of independent lines of stuff and leave your reader with, I don't get it. So you want to pay attention to that as well. If you don't pay attention to those kind of things, your findings can look really superficial or like there was a really kind of lazy job of analyzing um, with not much thought. And even sound research can look not very sound. Not because it wasn't well done and designed, but because a person doesn't know how to put together results in a way that makes sense for people. Does any of this ring true for y'all? Do you find yourselves encountering this yet? Chris, are you nodding just because, or yes, it makes sense, or? Yes, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anything occur to you about that? Specifics or just, oh yeah, I get that. No, I understand that part about <clears throat> like knowing what, you know your stuff yes. in your mind and yeah. then writing it and, and other people not being able to follow because it's kind of like this, I know what I'm trying to say, but yeah. somebody else isn't as familiar. That's one of the reasons a, a good critical reader can be helpful. Um, and I know I have spent hours with dissertation students of my own. Yeah. Okay, what are you trying to say here? And get a person to tell me, just in plain language, what they're trying to say. Because then they can translate back that, that back onto the paper. Because what's on the paper doesn't say exactly that. We start trying to sound real academic, which we need to sound in some ways. Or, like you said, it's all here but getting it out here can be really hard. Okay. I put this slide in because I like the picture. <laughs> Seriously, your results are kind of like a montage, if you will. I don't know if you can see this real well, but what, the, what the, all the pieces are, are the same photograph, uh, or the same, um, not photograph, the same um, Ferris wheel, but taken at different times of the day and from different angles and all that sort of thing. Somebody deconstructed all those photographs and then put them together to create this image of the Ferris wheel. And a lot of qualitative research has to do with deconstructing, not all of it, but a lot of it has to do with deconstructing data from multiple sources, whether that's interviewees and participants or documents or whatever, and putting it together in a new way so that connections are made. That's kind of what you're doing as well. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. All that stuff about selecting and editing and putting together, that's the work you do when you're doing data analysis. 
right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I started with with a point about this, and I want to go back to it because it's also important in, in how you write up your results. You really can't completely divorce your des your research design and your methodology from your results. Okay. They kind of all flow together. Your methods also, I mean your design, including your methods, also determine how rigor or credibility is established because it's not the same across all studies. And I know that there are um, researchers who don't have a, uh, much background in qualitative methods who really always want to see um, saturation of data, for example. Well, not all forms of phenomenology, for example, look for saturation of data. If you use uh, Van Manen, for example, he's not interested and says so in writing in saturated, uh, saturation of data and will tell you why and why it's inappropriate for that kind of study. Georgie, uh, that, the, the one that Adriana is using, that's an, another specific way of thinking about, he has a specific way of thinking about phenomenology, which means there's a specific, part of that is that there's a spe specific way of asking questions and trying to get at the experiences it was happening at the time it was happening, right? Mm -hmm. that's, I know that sounds confusing, but what, but what all of that means is that um, how you then present your findings needs to be consistent with whatever your study was designed to do and the theoretical tradition you're using, except when it doesn't. When it doesn't is when you're operating from a very pragmatic stance and there are some qualitative researchers who are more pragmatist in their approach. They're more likely to whip out something like, uh, I don't know if your, de your departments talk about them, but Saldana's book, you know, where there's a whole bunch of different methods of data analysis and just yank out whatever seems to fit the data and, but without really thinking about, well, I'm operating from Georgie's perspective and this is how he examines data, analyzes data, proves up rigor of the research and that sort of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Your chair and or methodologist uh, will work with you to decide that piece. But it's a d very different approach to doing qualitative research than, say, um, somebody who really operates from a, a postmodern or constructivist perspective. And both of those and pragmatism are very different from somebody who operates from more of an activism or social action uh, kind of perspective. Is, does that fit for all of you guys? So tell me a little bit about, I, I know yours and I already told everybody, she's working doing a phenomenological <laughs> study specifically in Georgie's tradition and I know that because I'm her chair. So how are you organizing, how have you conceptualized and done your design from what kind of perspective? Online, I'm using Robert Stake's uh, cross-case analysis and multiple case study. Okay, okay. Which has its own ways of looking at data and, you know, thinking about what makes caseness and maybe own ways of, I mean, there are specific, there are some methods that are of analyzing data that are recommended for case study or are fine with case study. It can have an impact on how you show your results, right? So I have a, a small piece of my study where my participants uh, journal mm -hmm. their experience. So like real basic call. 
Um, and it really is to support my intervention. So <coughs> what I'm planning to do is just simply looking for what was consistent throughout my participant, just like main themes throughout that, to see okay. what everyone experienced and how that fit in with the intervention. So you're using kind of some grounded theory methods yeah. for looking at I have an idea of what line by line data or yes. units of meaning and of coming up meaning. okay okay mm -hmm. okay yeah. which makes sense and the way you present your data mm -hmm. will be within your overarching research design yes. which is largely quant mm -hmm. with a qual piece that supports is that right yes okay mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and what are you doing do you know uh, kind of how you've designed it Um, importance is the observation and being very rich and descriptive about where and how you co collect stuff. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so strong descriptive skills are important for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh -huh. All right. And and that then informs, I assume, because I know nothing about your field, that informs the quantitative pieces the of your study is that correct yes a different kind of method can, pro can produce different uh, result mm -hmm. and even we run the same sample but on different machine uh, we can derive a very different result so okay. the method is very important to unify or to analyze the data in future yes yeah. Yeah, and it really has to be well described yes. or else what you're doing can't be replicated, it can't be looked yes. at further. Yes. Okay, gotcha. Yes. Are you doing any qual part right now? Uh, not for my dissertation, but mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there's a study that we have been mm -hmm. working together. Uh, it, in that study we are using, well, I would probably need and help with saying is the most Mustakas. A heuristic study, like mm -hmm. that design, mm -hmm. uh, which stems from, like the research idea stems from the researchers' own experiences, right. and it's mm -hmm. it's very similar to I would say like generic uh, phenomenological study in the sense of you like like do interviews, collect data, mm -hmm. And Mustakas has very particular ideas about then how you analyze data mm -hmm. and the various phases of data analysis. And probably wouldn't be possible, well, it would be, it's possible, but, because we've done it, but it's difficult to present all of that in a, like a journal article mm -hmm. if you did the whole of Mustakas' thing. But he has particular ways to that you exhibit your data after that too. You write up your data using exemplars and a creative synthesis and all of that sort of thing, which could be a poem or a picture. And most of us write the story up in our field. Okay. Am I beating this to death for you guys? Is this, okay. <clears throat> Usually, you're going to include, and again, it depends on your design. Um, some of these things depend on your design, but usually you're going to include disconfirming data. You can't just throw out pieces that don't happen to fit your themes. So you include disconfirming uh, data and normally we'll explain it in some way. I did a study um, about a, su a group supervision using psychodrama methods several years ago that's waiting for me to finish the write-up on. Okay. Um, 
The students loved it. The supervisees loved it, except one guy. He didn't love it. It was he he learned a lot, but he was not comfortable with the kind of interaction that you have to do in psychodrama, which is very personal, by the way, and very focused on self of the counselor. Um, and he talked about how uncomfortable he was with that. So that has to be accounted for in the write-up. You can't. I can't just pretend like it's not there and. You, you have to account for disconfirming that, and I have to explain that as best I can. And fortunately, he gave enough inter information in his interview <coughs> that he provided explanation himself. And I could theorize about it, but I probably won't because a phenomenological kind of study and he gets to speak for himself unless something brilliant occurs to me. It also should include sufficient data that whoever's reading it can sort for themselves um, the rigor of the study and whether your interpretation of the data fits the data that you've provided. And that's another issue that comes up, and we'll talk more when we get to problems. Um, people may, people fairly often come up with themes or categories that they then define, which you really need to do for the purpose of your study. Um, but when I read the data, the quotes, for instance, if it's from uh, interviews, I don't read that at all. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It may mean they haven't given us enough data for us to be able to see it. So I end up writing notes, or probably using track changes to say, your data doesn't support this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So make sure you have enough data if you're presenting themes or if you've done a narrative analysis, whatever that you support the interpretations you're, given, you're giving. Um, like I said, talk to your chair or your methodologist or both. It'll make your life e easier if, you're, if you have some coherent, consistent way of thinking about your design and your methods and including analysis and how you're findings are going to be presented kind of from beginning to end. It's real hard to chop this up well and have it breed well or make sense. Yes? Okay. Here's some common problems that I see and others see and some of these are in the literature. Um, one is when there doesn't seem to be any focus. We, I, referenced this before, but maybe there's a very loosely connected group of themes or they don't seem to be connected at all, um, or whatever kind of organizer you're using for your data just isn't focused. It doesn't give us much of anything to hold on to. Okay? It doesn't give us any sense of hope. <clears throat> Sometimes there really is a lack of depth in analysis. Somebody's done an initial quick read through, maybe falsely believing that qualitative research is easy. And um, you just go through and pick out a few quotes and you're done. Done work that way. Um, sometimes it's cut, the data really doesn't support results, and when you have a conversation with somebody else, you can begin to see that, that, wait a minute, no. Because because we all have preconceived notions and we can't help but carry those notions into our research. And it can be, if we don't have anybody else, a peer analyst or a methodologist or a chair or a peer who's also at this stage of academic development to 
to help you keep your own notions bracketed um, and in front of you, you know, keep yourself aware of them. Um, you may force your interpretations or the way you already saw stuff onto your data and we all have to be really wary of that. There's ways to make those same kinds of errors in quant. <laughs> you know, there's tests you run for that, I think. Um, but to help you avoid that. <clears throat> but, but the tool for making sure that you're not forcing your preconceived ideas onto the data you have has everything to do with being able to be reflective and being willing to be reflective and being willing to track your own responses from the beginning all the way through the research process. Um, now, there are times when it's not that you're forcing your data into themes, it is that you are doing a study that has to do with some particular theoretical model. And so you're specifically analyzing your data through the lens of the particular model. I can talk about models in my field. Um, like if I was talking about Dan Bandura's social um, cognitive learning theory, there are certain hallmark, hallmark traits that I might set up as preconceived codes. And specifically what I'm looking for is whether maybe my intervention or XYZ intervention <clears throat> enhanced students skills or recognition or whatever of these things or if, if the data I was getting supported these things role modeling you know that kind of stuff um, I don't know how to make a story that works for you <laughs> uh, for your field but but I have read dissertations and theses from like people who are getting degrees in statistics and there are models they use too you know general models and so maybe the thing all the data points they're looking at they're examining in terms of a particular theoretical model I'm guessing that's true in your field as well so there's nothing wrong with that I mean, actually, it's a needed kind of research, <coughs> even in something as seemingly touchy-feely as counseling. But you have to be clear that's what you're doing. And that if you are doing that, that should have been addressed up in Chapter 2. Yeah, so it reminded, uh, reminded me of one example to show how people appear as too false the themes of the, all this uh, conclusion. It's like a story uh, my teacher told me. Like some scientists want to test whether the air of Geico are, are on the Geico's feet. So it's like, so they want to test whether the Geico's air is on their feet. Okay, so they the scientists just uh, like to collect to find us uh, two gecko, geckos and uh, yell to them run, a gecko run. Okay. Then the scientists cut their feet, and they, this time they also uh, yell to this gecko run. The gecko stop because they need to have food. I don't know. Uh, they have any feet. So the scientists give conclusion: the air is on the gecko's feet because they come here now. They kind of run, they kind of hear now. So then my, my teacher... That's a good story. <laughs> I'm going to remember yeah. that. And use it. My uh, advisor used to tell me, so when you see when you hear this story, it's very stupid. But for the scientist, when you do scientist, when you do all this data and analyze, if you have some like uh, false conclusion, you may want to guide yourself to get this similar conclusion. Yes. To get that like, Geico's air is on their feet. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a wonderful <laughs> story. That's a wonderful story. I'm using it. I think <laughs> you have something very similar to that uh, with okay. leases, like uh, lease. Like lice. So they say, it's like a joke actually, people say there's a joke. So they say a scientist like cuts 
one of the like legs of the lice and mm -hmm. it still jumps two, it still jumps three, it still jumps four, and then it cannot jump and the scientist reports it got deaf after cutting for the Are you bringing that story from Turkey or did you yes, hear it's it? From Turkey. Right. It's it's a good story. <laughs> We have to, y'all have to help me remember these long yeah. enough to get back to the office working. Because I can use those in fall too. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing that we, we've already talked about is that your themes or categories or whatever organizers you're using, the, the math language person um, was talking about, part of her results were presented in terms of decades. Which was uh, appropriate. I mean, that was the the lit review part, uh, not lit review, um, but the analysis of literature is what I should say. And it was presented in decades, and it made perfectly good sense. And you could clearly see the progression and change over time. Um, had she done that another way, and uh, I'm not sure it would have worked at all. Um, but to get to that and, and make that decision to present it that way took a lot of thought on her part because there are other ways she could have presented data um, and, her, and, and what all she learned from this multi-year um, examination of literature <coughs> that could have just read like a list. Themes and categories can read like a list. Bad writing, I've already indicated. Um, like I said, I, I started to take that phrase out um, because I didn't want to sound judgmental, but it's as good, it, it works. And, and bad writing doesn't necessarily mean uh, poor grammar, although it, it can. What I'm talking about, though, is that ability to tell whatever story you're telling in a way that takes the reader with you, because that's your job. Unless you're writing purely for other people in your specific field, it, it's pretty useless if people can't read it. Overstating, misstating results. Um, I read that sometimes when people are reporting statistical procedures and then writing up their findings and what they mean. Uh, but I also read it sometimes in qualitative studies. Um, people may, like I said, may make a theme or a category out of little pieces of information that really don't fit together to make a theme or a category. It just isn't there. Or they make a claim. They may make a claim that this and this and this, taken together, um, represent this overarching theme. Well, not really. At least not with what you've told me. You're so familiar with your data that maybe that really is true. But with what you've told us, because we don't see the raw data, it's not there. It's not there. And I've got to. I've got to be able to see it. Your readers have got to be able to see it. <coughs> this next one is really, really common. And may be one of the hardest things for people who are writing qualitative dissertations that where you come up with themes or categories or um, anything in the phenomenology area or grounded theory uh, area. People get a label or name for a category in their heads um, and then they start trying to define it and it, it just it doesn't come and sometimes and, and what can happen and this is a good thing if it happens <coughs> when you start if you're doing that kind of uh, if you have those kind of findings that are around categories and themes and sub themes if, if it doesn't even if you've been through your data multiple times and you've analyzed and reanalyzed, if you start writing it up and you can't make it fit, you probably need to go back and look again. Or you need to consult with 
a peer analyst or a peer reviewer or your dissertation chair or your methodologist or a content person on your dissertation so that you can talk about your findings and see if somebody can help you think about it differently. Sometimes it's enough, and it's been enough for me as chair to be able to say, you're forcing it, and you're still, it sounds like you're still forcing it. If you're not able to write it and have it come out of the other end of your pen or off your fingertips on the keyboard in a way that seems to coherently fit together, it doesn't mean writing will be easy, but then something's off and you need to, you're better off to back off, give yourself a little space to think about it and come at it again. Maybe it's as simple as finding a different descriptor for your overarching theme. Because I get a word stuck in my head sometimes, but it's not broad enough. It's just not broad enough. And I can't tell you how much it can help to have other people to talk to about that. That's what I'm thinking because it's scary. Because mm -hmm. I know sometimes I get stuck in the opposite. It's not that I have one word, it's that I have zero words. <laughs> <laughs> I know how this feels, but I cannot find one uh -huh. word to describe it. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and somebody whose brain works kind of like yours does may have better luck finding a picture first. Mm -hmm. Or um, that just reminds you, maybe not of the thing, but that has that same feeling. Yeah. So that you can begin to play with words. Or it may help you to talk, like I said, to somebody, me or, so, mm -hmm. or one of your cohort members. Uh, this is what it's like. And have people say, is it this? Mm -hmm. Is it kind of like that? Sounds like mm -hmm. yeah. until it gets right, mm -hmm. until you have that aha. Does, writing groups can be helpful. Yeah. They can also be not helpful, but, but if they're set up well and with people you can really work with, who can read each other's stuff or you can talk through, they, they can be really, really helpful in, in writing qualitative stuff already said this more than once, I'll say it again, <clears throat> if you end up reporting results in a way that are not consistent with your design and your methods, it can cause problems. And depending on who your committee, who your committee members are, um, that can get treated as a minor thing or a major thing. Where it can get treated as a more major thing is when you submit for publication of your results into journals because major journals very often have people on the editorial board who specialize in particular methodologies and who will write things back like fatal flaw <laughs> you know can't be redeemed which I think is you know kind of snooty academic talk sometimes uh, and I think most stuff can be redeemed. It was just explained badly. But um, if you, uh, I'm always concerned, for example, when so, uh, uh, somebody submits an article that's qualitative and they include things in the limitations like sample size was small. Because a, a qualitative researcher kind of editor is going to say, why is this here? No. Unless they kind of do that on the side. Because mm -hmm. small sample size is not a limitation right. of qualitative research to qualitative researchers. Yeah. People who are much more interested in um, studying large populations or doing statistical analyses of specific kind of results from treatment interventions, that sort of thing. For them, um, because they're looking for different things and they're trying to prove up different stuff. I use the phrase prove up loosely um, because I'm not sure it's a phrase they would agree with. 
but they're trying to prove up different different things than what you're doing when you're doing a qualitative study. You know, maybe they're trying to establish that something is a best practice. They've got to meet particular kinds of standards to have whatever the treatment approach is established as an evidence-based practice. Okay. I'm not going to say more about poor writing, aren't you? You do understand, though, what I mean by that, that I'm not picking on people's ability to write sentences, although that's important. Okay. 